What happens when a country loses its currency and adopts a newer, stronger currency? It progresses, right? We've seen through history that the adoption of a stronger currency significantly aids in the progress of a country, like the war struck Germany who decided to shift from their currency, the Reichmark, to the Euro. What if I told you that adopting a newer, stronger currency just isn't enough? What if I told you that you can still lag as a nation despite having no debts? What if I told you that there is a country, despite having one of the world's strongest currencies, is still lagging behind? Hi guys, and welcome once again to the Wealth Lab! Despite having no debts, the banks in this country were dysfunctional by 2007, and many had to close. Shortly after, in 2008, its economy collapsed and brought historic depression rates of unemployment. It had a debt of over 36% of its GDP in 2007. The ruling party didn't have any money or supporters, and the economy was in utter chaos. Now you might be thinking, we're introducing yet another third world country. However, we aren't. This country was none other than Spain. Spain had to go through a lot after its bloody civil war. The country was in utter shambles, development was slow, and life was hard. It's fair to say the country had its fair share of painful and destructive experiences under the dictatorship. After the dictatorship ended, Spain tried hard to win back its European counterparts' trust by adopting newer, forward-thinking policies to help Spain's position in Europe. Spain sacrificed its currency and adopted the Euro. But little did they know, sacrificing their currency was the beginning of a chain reaction that still affects the country's economy and employment rates till this day. Time passed and Spain's bubble kept growing until it burst to bring down utter chaos into the country. And in this video, we're gonna dive into the greatest economic bubble there has ever been. Enjoying this video so far? Remember to hit that subscribe and like button. Okay. Let's get back to the video. Before we start, let's get a quick overview. Spain is one of the world's largest regions. It's a European country located in the southwest corner of Europe. It includes 17 regions immersed in various cultures and traditions. Madrid is the capital city of Spain. Spain's official currency has been known as the Euro since 2002. However, before the Euro, the silver made Pastea was their state's currency from 1869 to 2002. Now that we've covered a fair bit of ground on what, who, and where Spain is, let's get back to the video. To understand the world's greatest bubble, we need to understand the history that led up to it. In 1939, Spain was in ruins after the Spanish Civil War. The country's fate was in the hands of anarchists, communists, and nationalists for a large period until General Francisco Franco overthrew Spain's leftist republican government. Millions were victims of bombardment, execution, and assassination. The Spanish Civil War was a clear showcase of Franco's tyranny and fascism, resulting in abhorrently slow development and exclusions from recovery programs like the US Marshall Plan. Spain had a lot to prove under General Franco's dictatorship after the World War. It wasn't until the 1950s before Spain was back up on its feet again, which was years later than most Western economies. Its economy had been heavily reliant on real estate and construction under the dictator's rule. Honestly speaking, General Franco's policies weren't the best. In becoming an independent country that couldn't care less about what other countries had to say, Spain experienced a dire shortage of foreign exchange reserves by the late 50s. However, Franco's plans of stabilization and unexpected liberalization brought about a Spanish economic miracle. Considering Spain was a bloody dictatorship, this was a surprising move at the time. Interestingly, over 3 million people, about 10% of the population at the time, moved to urban areas in the 1960s, while a significant group moved offshore, providing valuable remittances. Consequently, the added benefits from the remittances allowed Spain to collaborate with international organizations like GATT, known now as the WTO. Franco's aims of liberalization and stabilization allowed for economic progress as the dictator started working with well-known Spanish brands that were gaining international recognition. However, General Franco didn't get to live much longer as he died in 1975. Spain continued to progress and keep up the momentum. For years, the method worked. 
However, Spain still had an insanely high unemployment rates throughout the 80s and the 90s, often over 20% of the workforce. However, it rose from being an underdeveloped country run by a dictator in less than three decades, becoming a modern, wealthy, technologically advanced European social democracy. Spain's shift to democracy paved the way for the country to join hands with the European Economic Community, or as we know it today, the EU. After the bloodbath during the Spanish Civil War, Spain tried very hard to stand out and prove itself as a feasible, credible, and more importantly, safe country. To do so, Spain was one of the first countries to adopt the Euro in 1999 to showcase how far the country had come and how forward-thinking it could be. Enjoying this video so far? Remember to hit that subscribe and like button. Okay, let's get back to the video. The Spanish bull economy grew around 4% a year, projecting higher numbers than most of Europe or the US, and jobs were being pumped into the market. Interestingly, the exceedingly high 20% unemployment rate dropped down to unbelievable single digits for the first time in its history. Interestingly, at the heart of all of this were houses. While you may have thought about technological or industrial advancements that led Spain to come out of this ditch, it was led by housing. 87% of private homes were owned by 2007. Interestingly, that number's never been over 70% in the US. Eyebrow raising, isn't it? Now, let's try to dissect why it was housing. After Spain adopted the euro, it lost its ability to devalue its currency or set its interest rates. Moreover, adopting the euro meant Spain could trade a lot easier with its neighbors and it became significantly easier to pay for import through a stronger currency like the euro. Most importantly of all, it allowed Spain to gain access to cheaper credits. However, Spain continued to project unimpressive numbers in the flow of goods, services, and money. The country already projected negative numbers before adopting the euro. Interestingly, the cheaper credits were just the beginning of the domino effect. Investors started monitoring the country as they believed Spain's credits were as good as Germany, Greece, and Italy. However, there was a lot more to the eye than investors could see. Although there was increasing demand, which caused interest rates to narrow down, the Spanish government hardly had anything to do with it. The debts were low and the Spanish economy projected excellent numbers. Which raises the question, who caused it? Large construction firms often borrow money from regional saving banks through the international market. Spain had over 45 regional saving banks before the 2008 crisis, many of whom had skeptical anticipations and had put all of their fate into speculative real estate. Now this may all seem simple, however, Spain's debt system was just utterly flawed. Interestingly, before Spain joined the EU, they were the first to require banks to set aside money for non-performing loans. Spain set aside over 35 billion euros for borrowers who hadn't scheduled payments for over 90 days. However, little did they know, this wouldn't be enough. Now coming back to the housing bubble. During the 2000s, the average house price saw record numbers, which at the time was a common trend in many economies that emphasized construction growth. However, this is where Spain stood out. Because larger construction firms kept borrowing money from regional saving banks, Credit for the real estate sector exceeded credit for the economy overall. By the time the crisis hit, millions of homeowners could not pay back their loans, leading to Spain's real estate debt equating to almost half the GDP. Don't forget, Spain heavily emphasized construction-related employment such that one in eight workers was employed in construction. Spain projected three times the number of newer construction projects than Germany, France, the UK, and Italy combined. Enjoying this video so far? Remember to hit that subscribe and like button. Okay, let's get back to the video. Now you might be thinking, why did Spain finance so many construction projects? There were three core reasons. After Spain adopted the euro, it experienced cheaper credit rates, which was a key reason Spain financed so many construction projects. The second reason being the government's liberalization of the real estate sector. And lastly, the general economic growth model was established around construction activity to control unemployment rates. Interestingly, the government's pro-real estate policies saw a generous support as 87% of the Spanish population were homeowners. However, Spain's flawed policies, increasing credit, and misinterpretation led to the burst of an economic bubble. 
average house prices crashed by 45%, pushing a lot of the population into negative equity. This means that the houses were worth less than the debt. In 2008, the credit started to dry up and panic took over the world, which led to people pulling out from investing in houses. Speculative developers who'd borrowed heavily from regional banks quickly turned into non-performing loans. The increasing number of non-performing loans was just too much to handle for the 35 billion euros set aside by the Spanish government. So what did Spain do to save itself? Spain decided to retaliate in two ways. First, by spending more as a percentage of GDP on stimulus than any country in Europe. Interestingly, Spain spent around 6.5% of its GDP on fiscal stimulus, which was not a problem considering their low debt. However, things were cooking up in the EU as the Greek crisis took new forms, but that's something we'll explain in another video. After the Greek crisis, the EU was playing safe by hunting for the next crisis. While Spain projected low debt numbers, its economic model was just not sustainable. Speculations raised over whether Spain would be able to borrow enough money for long enough to fix its economy. This resulted in the bailouts of Spain's banks and the establishment of a whole new system. 43 of the 45 regional saving banks merged to create underperforming banks. This way, Spain was able to filter out underperforming banks from performing ones. However, Spain still had to face challenges from the sacrifice of its currency. It had to go through structural reforms to get back up on its feet, which resulted in a record high 30% unemployment rate. So how did Spain become the Spain we know today? Well, Spain was lucky enough to overtake its pre-recession GDP peak in 2017. Moreover, it has become a significant player in the Eurozone economy. Occasionally, the country accounts for a significant share in the overall growth of the Eurozone economy itself. Interestingly, a lot of growth is attributed to Spain's exports becoming a crucial contributor to the GDP. The success of Spain's exports is attributed to declining labor costs as the country imposed structural reforms. Moreover, Spain's current account entered a surplus in 2016 for the first time since 1986. Interestingly, Spain has consistently projected positive numbers in its current account ever since displaying a more respectable growth trajectory than it did in its history. However, Spain still has a lot of issues that will continue to deter its full recovery. Spain still sees exceedingly high unemployment rates. Hiring workers in Spain is extremely expensive, which is why there's an influx of temporary contracts providing lesser job security. Interestingly, over 26% of the labor force are classified as temporary workers. Moreover, we can point some of Spain's unemployment issues towards the high numbers of early leavers for education, resulting in an insanely high youth unemployment rate. There are many reasons why it's very challenging for Spain to recover from its economic bubble. Persistent unemployment rates, temporary workers, a high number of early leavers, high youth unemployment rates are some of the main factors at play for Spain's crash during the pandemic. In conclusion, Spain has made a comeback that was next to impossible, progressing from a dictatorship to one of the largest contributors to the Eurozone economy. Spain's adoption of the Euro was questionable, which ultimately led to the housing bubble. However, Spain got back up on its feet despite its flawed economic growth model thanks to its structural reforms. One can say many of Spain's economic problems today are descendant of its unresolved issues. However, one can only wonder if they're ever going to be fixed. What do you think? Leave a comment in the comment section down below. Thanks for watching, and see you in the next video.